You already know that I share a lot of my personal life on YouTube, so I'll skip over a lot of the boring parts and get right to the juicy stuff. I was born on a little island in the Caribbean called Trinidad. What some of you guys don't know is I was actually conceived out of wedlock. That was an accident. My parents were still in college. These things happen. They got married three months before I was born and then moved to Trinidad. Two years after I was born, my little sister Deka came along and we played outside all the time. I'll never forget, there was this girl that lived directly behind me. She was like 17 and she was so beautiful. One day I was playing with my toys and she took one of my action figures, stood him up, and drew him. I thought this was witchcraft. I grabbed my own pencil and paper and started drawing too. I showed my parents and they freaked out. Even though it probably looked like crap, that was the right encouragement at the right time. And I drew almost every day from that day on. Now in Trinidad, I lived in a town called Digomatin. And at the time, it was a pretty rough area. Like I remember going to the bank and my dad would tell me, if some guys come in here wearing masks and they start screaming and waving guns around, just lay down on the floor, don't look at them. And I remember waking up one night and saw some random guy in my hallway and then another random guy going through my drawer and I was like, oh, I've been expecting you guys. Well, I know what to do. I'm just gonna lay here and look away. I wake up the next morning and walk into the living room. Yeah, we've been robbed. So as a safety measure, my parents put bars on all the doors and all the windows and then we got like 10 attack guard dogs. And some of you guys might have noticed I have a little scar on my left cheek. That's because one of those dogs attacked me. A few months after that, we packed up all of our stuff and moved to America. The first thing I noticed is that the soda here tasted really nasty. The second thing I noticed, y'all had cable TV. See, in Trinidad, we only had two channels. One that showed Looney Tunes all day, and another channel that showed all kung fu movies with the cheesy sound effects. And then I discovered the Disney animated movies. Shortly after I discovered Disney, I discovered anime. And right around the time I found anime, I got into video games. When I had that controller in my hand, everything in the world just felt right. Well, you know, I didn't perform too well in school because I was so obsessed. My dad was really big on grades. I don't know, it's like when I would study, I would get bad grades. And when I wouldn't study, I would still get bad grades. So it just felt like a lose-lose situation. Meanwhile, my sister is getting like A's and B's and Whenever we get good grades, he would reward us with stuff. So here she is, like, you know, at nine years old. But he just bought her a Lexus and a TV and a bunch of crap that she doesn't need. It was around this time that I got my hands on a camcorder. This is way before YouTube. I'd record little video blogs and then have my friends come over and I'd sit them down and watch it. Now, from kindergarten to fifth grade, like so many other YouTubers that you've seen me draw my lives for, I got bullied too. In middle school, my parents sent me to a private school and I got bullied there too. It was also around this time that all my friends started getting girlfriends. Anytime any relationship drama would start, I, for whatever reason, became the guy that everybody would come to. So after school every day, I was literally on the phone for hours talking to different friends that was having different relationship problems. I'd hear myself give some advice and I'd be like, yo, I need to write this down because 13 year olds aren't supposed to be thinking like this. Now at this private school, they would borderline force Jesus down your throat. And as I'm reading along in my Bible, it's saying how Jesus was very humble and would share his knowledge. That's not what these guys were doing. Now my parents started to notice that my teachers weren't really that qualified. So in 10th grade, they sent me to a public school. And believe it or not, the period that I dreaded the most was lunch because I had zero friends. So what I would do is I would buy my lunch, go outside by myself and eat. It was pretty depressing. I was so happy when I actually started making friends. So when I started going to the public school, I could wear whatever I want. And I started wearing a lot of Nike clothes. And kids started calling me Nike boy. Some friends called me Swoosh. And then Swoosh eventually evolved into the name Swoozy. One of my friends that I got in good with, his name was Will. And Will worked at Disney. Every other day he would come in with these hilarious stories about his job and the people that he worked with and the guests that would come in at Disney. I needed some money to support my video game habit, so I figured, hey, let me try Disney's. And I got hired. I really wanted to make friends with all the college program kids, but the managers did a very good job of quarantining me to the point to where it wasn't cool to hang out with me at all. Stopped working at Disney, but the one job that I really enjoyed was when I got the job at Hard Rock Hotel. And it was around this time that a little game fell into my lap called Dead or Alive. And when I got online with it, there weren't a lot of people that were beating me. I was just going on like, 
150 game win streaks before I'd get a single loss. People would join my room just to watch me. Word of mouth about me spread really quickly in DOA because of how I played with this character. I got so involved in this game, like I found a fan website, I was writing articles, I was doing interviews. DOA 4 came out and they changed up so many moves for my character. I had no style in the game anymore, like all the moves that I built my style around were gone. It's almost like telling Michael Jackson, we need you to perform, you can't do the moonwalk, you can't grab your crotch, you can't say hee hee, you can't do none of that. Pretty much stopped playing DOA seriously and was just doing school and working at Hard Rock Hotel full time. One of the things I loved working at Hard Rock, you got to hang out with celebrities all the time. I would see some celebrities come out there who hated their fans. I'm not even joking with you guys. I graduated high school and then everyone was asking me that question, okay, what are you gonna do now that you're in the real world? And I would tell people, I wanna, I wanna do a movie. I wanna be a writer slash director. And everyone with the exception of about three people did a very good job of stomping all over my dreams. Now, because I loved animation, I applied at Ringling School of Art and Design and CalArts. I get into one of these really deep conversations that you have, you know, with your friends, and she was saying, you know, when I say I love a guy, I show it. When I say I love God, I don't really show it. And that conversation stuck with me for a few days, and coincidentally, I heard somebody else give an interesting point that kind of picked up where that conversation left off, and he said, People talk about beliefs, if this stuff is real, you should be able to test it, you should be able to apply it to your life, you should be able to see the results, and everybody around you should be able to see the results. Planes weigh 84,000 pounds, there's nothing about that big chunk of steel that should allow it to fly at 30,000 feet. When you add rubber in the right place and you curve that metal a certain way, then get it to a certain speed, there's a whole list of rules that once you apply it to that piece of metal, that will allow us to do the impossible. And just the way he was putting it all together, it really stuck with me. So I thought to myself, you know what? Let me try to apply some of these moral rules to my lifestyle. All of a sudden, my life got 10 times worse. CalArts denied me. Ringling denied me. Saved up all summer to hook up my car. It got broken into and they stole everything. My girlfriend, she cheated on me. I did a really good job of masking how I really felt on the outside, but everything was going wrong. I remember coming home after a bad day and I went over to YouTube and I found this video from this guy called Winecone. And the videos he was putting up back then had me rolling. Like I remember watching one of his videos and I laughed so hard. If I ever get on YouTube, this is gonna be my primary objective, is to give people what I feel right now. One day out of the complete blue random, I get a call from this girl named Diane. Now Diane starts telling me how there's gonna be this gaming event, it's gonna be on TV, it's gonna be in San Francisco, and because I was really rusty and not really playing DOA 4 that much, I tried to back out like a little punk, like, nah, 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 I'm I. She said, as soon as we pick you up from the airport, we will give you $500 cash, and once you get there, you're gonna be competing for $10,000 and you'll be on TV. Okay, at that point she had me. You guys remember how I said I was having a string of bad luck? Guess what happened next? Yeah, my Xbox got the red ring of death, so I could not practice. Flew over to San Francisco, came in third, and then went back to work at Hard Rock Hotel. Now, once I got back to work, I was constantly coming back from my shifts late because once word started spreading around the hotel that I wanted to be on TV, everybody wanted to stop me and ask me how I got into the gaming thing. You know what? I'm just gonna make a YouTube channel and I'll update everybody there so that way I'm not like a broken record 90 times a day repeating the same thing. And I slowly felt myself getting gradually addicted to uploading videos. So, shortly after this, I stumbled onto an interview at CG channel.com where they're interviewing one of the top guys at ILM and toward the end of the interview he said he was going through the process of finding a project that would take him from 0 to 60 for their first attempt at making a feature film. I just called up ILM and got a hold of this guy. He actually passed me through to his superior, Patty Blau, and as I'm talking to this lady, I'm looking her up on IMDB, worked on Jurassic Park, she worked on Back to the Future 3, she worked on Star Wars Episode 6, so I told her about my script, she told me where to send it, she got back to me and she was like, this is one of the most layered screenplays I've gotten in years. For our first project, we kind of wanted to target the Shrek audience and demographic, this project is more PG-13, so unfortunately we're going to have to pass, and they actually passed on my script to make the movie Rango. Now, back in the gaming world, DirecTV announces that they're actually going to start a full-blown TV show about gaming. They're going to have a draft, 
and the best players that compete at this competition are going to get $30,000 and be on a team. And you guys know the expression, don't quit your day job? That's exactly what I did, okay? I saved up for about a month and a half, and then I kind of just went on call, and it was the scariest move I had ever made in my entire life. Because most of the top DOA players, they didn't have day jobs, so they just sat home playing DOA, practicing all day, and I already had a lot of catching up to do, so practiced my butt off, took my last $1,500, spent it on a plane ticket and a hotel, and I even overdrew from my bank account. I'm not gonna lie, I had to call my parents and ask for some money to get transferred over to my bank account. The day of the event, I was so nervous. And to add to all the stress, I had a manager walk up to me and he was like, some of these other top players, they're saying you're all hype, you're saying you're not good at this game, I hear you're a nice guy and everything, but I don't care about that. I'm here to pick the best players in DOA, and from what I'm hearing, you're not one of them, so don't be surprised if I don't pick you. So the tournament starts, I win one, I lose one, win one, lose one, and the players I was losing to weren't really considered top players. The managers at this tournament had the power to pull two players of their choosing out of the brackets and set them up on the main stage for a challenge match. Then the managers started calling me up for the challenge matches. They put me up against all the top DOA players that were there back to back, and I went undefeated. Then I got matched up with one of the dudes that I suspected was doing a lot of this trash talking and I beat the brakes off this dude. And then for my final challenge match, I got set up to fight Master. Now, out of the last 10 DOA tournaments, Master had won like 13 of them. So I sat down, win around, lose around, win around, lose around, win around, and then Master suddenly just stands up and goes to shake my hand and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, it's, it's done, it's over, congratulations. I look at the screen and I won by one round. So the next day of the draft, you know, they drive us over to the Playboy Mansion and I got drafted to the Los Angeles team. Putting my day job, not having any money in the bank, like this was a huge moment for me. You know, Master gets drafted to the Dallas team. So at the after party, I walk up to him and I'm like, hey, if you intentionally took a dive, it means more to me than you will ever know. And I kind of got a little choked up. For every team, you had a male DOA player and a female DOA player. My team drafted a female who had just picked up DOA, so she really didn't know too much about the game. However, my manager believed, because she was a competitive PC player, that she'd be able to pick up DOA pretty quickly. That wasn't the case. DirecTV moved all the players out to LA to film the first season, and my manager had me spending all eight weeks teaching my teammate how to play this game. So for those eight weeks that I was out there, I only won like two games. I had no practice. Needless to say, come season two, I didn't get drafted. However, DirecTV had me on the show doing MC work and some hosting stuff, so I'd interview the players, that kind of thing. Now right after season two ended with DirecTV, this other video game TV show came along called WCG Ultimate Gamer. I went out, I auditioned, I got casted, and that whole experience was just equally as crazy. So with all this crazy traveling and all the exciting gaming stuff going on, I had a lot of content to put up on my YouTube channel. A few months later, a mutual friend of mine introduced me to his classmate, a girl by the name of Michelle Fonz. Michelle did YouTube and she had like 200,000 subscribers at the time. So we started following each other on Twitter. We started DMing each other. She was like, you need to get up on that partner program and you need to start taking YouTube really serious because your videos are pretty good. Took her advice, skip forward a year and a half. I'm out in LA for a gaming event and my friend Jacob Patterson takes me to a house party. I walk in, Shay Carl is there, Smosh is there. About 30 minutes after I got there, in walks Andrea's Choice and Michelle Fawn. And this was actually the very first time me and Michelle met each other in real life. We sat down on the couch and we pretty much just talked for two and a half hours. Toward the end of the conversation, she was like, dude, let's just do a collab channel together. After we did our collab channel, both of our individual channels had gotten crazy to the point to where we couldn't even really devote proper time to our gaming channels. And one afternoon, I opened up my email and YouTube had sent me a gift card to buy some camera equipment. Now to some of you guys, that might not mean a whole lot. Even though they sent this gift card to a few hundred other people, I was so honored that I had grabbed the attention of the staff, one, two, I had so much admiration for this website, it felt like they believed in me. It's something that cost nothing, yet my entire life, all my friends and family, they couldn't do it. I'm just a boy with a dream, so, and to wrap this all up, I don't know if I'll ever become a film writer or director, I don't know where this crazy train is going, but I do have a plan, and I do know that this YouTube website and the community that comes along with it is one of the best thing that's ever happened to me. Every view, every like, every comment, like to you guys, it's just numbers on my page, but to me, those are people that believe in me. And all my life, 
That's all I've ever really wanted. 